This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Hello, my name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our presentation with Paul Kelly, editor at large at The Australian, and Troy Bramston, senior writer and columnist at The Australian. Paul and Troy will be in conversation with journalist and author Tori Shepherd as they discuss their recently published book, The Truth of the Palace Letters. It is now my pleasure to welcome Paul Kelly, Troy Bramston and Tori Shepherd. Thank you. Troy Bramston and Paul Kelly, thanks so much for joining us. We're here to talk about your book, The Truth of the Palace Letters. We're going to dive right into it. I thought I'd start with, now you're both Republicans. How did you end up wading so deeply into the story of the dismissal? Paul, you were reporting on it at the time, weren't you? Well, I was. I was there. I was at Parliament House covering the dismissal 45 years ago on the 11th of November, 1975. I lived through it, the drama, the chaos, the confusion, the malevolent nature of the day. I wrote a book about the dismissal in early 1976, another one 20 years later, and I've done two books on the dismissal with Troy. So this most recent book, The Truth of the Palace Letters, is my fourth book on this dramatic event. And on that day, were you immediately aware of, I guess, the history changing nature of that event? Undoubtedly. The constitutional crisis had gone on for four weeks. This was the most adrenaline charged moment in Australian political history. It was an epic clash conducted on the floor of parliament and in public opinion between Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser, with, of course, the apex of the triangle being Sir John Kerr at Government House. Both Fraser and Whitlam were talking to John Kerr. Now, the dismissal was always one of the options. We knew it was an option, we wrote about it, but the truth is we didn't really take it seriously. We didn't actually think a dismissal would happen. We didn't believe that in 1975, the Governor General would actually dismiss the Prime Minister and certainly not the way Kerr did in a constitutional ambush at lunchtime, giving Whitlam no chance to go to the election as Prime Minister. This was a truly extraordinary event. We don't want anything like this again. We don't want such an upheaval in Australian politics. And yet, as a journo, I kind of wish I'd been there and I wish I'd got a chance to see something that, that dramatic unfold. Now, Troy, I'm going to take a guess here. You weren't reporting at the, at the time of the dismissal. What's your first encounter with this story? Yeah, Tori, look, I was born actually six weeks after the dismissal in 1975, um, but I always felt that this was a, the most dramatic, convulsive, divisive event, you know, a great clash of personalities, constitutional issues, political brinkmanship. I mean, there's no more exciting, enthralling, interesting political story uh, almost in my lifetime um, than the dismissal. And so when I was in high school, I, the, my first sort of introduction to this story was the death of John Kerr in 1991. And I very vividly remember uh, seeing a, a, a newspaper, uh, an afternoon newspaper that had been published reporting the death. And he's, he had actually died and uh, been buried um, in secret. Um, because he was still a divisive figure. So the news had broken after that had already taken place a week or so earlier. 
Um, and so I made it my sort of mission to sort of understand as much about this as I could. Um, I wrote that high school project uh, when I was 15. And then in subsequent decades, you know, I went through old newspaper reports. I tracked down documentaries. I read all the books uh, you, you could find. Um, and I went and visited and met and interviewed a lot of the people involved, including Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser, um, opposition uh, MPs, government ministers, staff, public servants, people at the palace in, in London and also a government house in Sydney. And I also wrote a letter to Paul Kelly when I was a university student about the dismissal, uh, having been captivated by his first book, um, The Unmaking of Gough, published in 1976. So for me, it's been a, an almost full life obsession, um, but I come to this story from a different generational perspective. And I think that's what makes my sort of partnership with Paul uh, in, you know, we've been writing about this stuff in the newspaper in the Australian and in two books now for nearly 10 years together. So we have a different generational perspective. We both have different experiences. And so that's what makes it also an interesting partnership for us, as well as a compelling story to tell for new generations. And Troy, did Paul write back to you? He did. He wrote back to me. Look, I uh, quite presumptuously asked him to send me a copy of his book because I, I had a university library copy, Sydney University. So I wrote to Paul saying how much I enjoyed his book and had the temerity to ask if he could send me a free copy. And he did. So uh, there you go. So if you want a free book, uh, write, write to Paul Kelly. He'll, he'll send you one. <laughs> and that was the start of a beautiful collaboration. So, look, I'm going to start with the foreword by Paul, Paul Keating, PJK. Um and a quote, he wrote, Kerr was the black spider on the constitutional web, but the web was the creation of only one person, Malcolm Fraser. Paul, can I start with you? Was that immediately obvious that that was the way that the power structures were working? I mean, I remember when I first heard about the dismissal, I think I heard Kerr's side first, you know, that, oh, it was the only thing I could have done. Well, of course, complete nonsense. It was the only thing I could have done. I mean, <clears throat> Kerr had a range of options he could have engaged in. But go to your question about Malcolm Fraser. It was obvious that Malcolm Fraser triggered the crisis. There was a protracted debate in the weeks before the budget came to the Senate about whether the Fraser-led opposition would allow the budget to go through or whether it would break constitutional convention block the budget and try and force the Whitlam government to the people. And Fraser at the end of the day decided to smash convention, defer the budget in the Senate, pass a motion in the Senate requiring the Whitlam government to go immediately to the people. So there's no doubt that the instigator of the crisis was Malcolm Fraser. That was the first step. The second step then was Gough Whitlam's decision that he would defy Fraser, he would defy the Senate, he would not go to the people, he would stay in government because supply had not run out. So government services were still being delivered. And Whitlam's a tactic was to stay in government and maximise pressure on the Senate and the Fraser-led opposition to crack their nerve. Because the interesting thing was that the public uh, sentiment about 70% to 30% was against the blocking of the budget. So Whitlam used all his oratory and all his skills to try and break Fraser and smash the Senate. That he failed to do over the next four weeks. And his failure to do that meant that Kerr had to take a final decision. And of course, he had many options. He should have had a frank discussion with the Prime Minister, warned the Prime Minister in the classic use of the vice-regal powers, but Kerr didn't do that. Instead of that, he consulted the Chief Justice and with the backing of the Chief Justice, decided to dismiss Whitlam in a constitutional ambush. Look, we might come back to the Constitution and to the Senate being held to ransom as well a little bit later, but Troy, do you, do you who do you have sympathy for in this situation? Have you got sympathy for Whitlam, for anyone? 
Look, there are no heroes in this story. You know, I think that John Kerr um, misunderstood his role. He saw himself as a as an umpire. That's a phrase he used when, in actual fact, he is the guardian um, of the Constitution. And he should have, if he was going to play a role, uh, he should have uh, tried to seek an outcome uh, short of a surprise dismissal. Um, I have some sympathy for Gough Whitlam. I mean, Gough Whitlam is one of these sort of titanic figures who is kind of great, uh, but also tragic, you know. I mean, Gough made serial blunders um, during the crisis. He misread Kerr. He underestimated Malcolm Fraser. There were opportunities throughout the crisis where he could have chosen a different course of action, um, and he didn't. He didn't do any contingency planning. Uh, he didn't expect uh, to be dismissed, even though it was being talked about and the opposition uh, were, in fact, calling for it. Um, and, of course, after his dismissal, just after 1pm on the 11th of November, he went back to the lodge and had a steak for lunch. He didn't even tell the senators that he had been uh, dismissed. He called a bunch of staff, public servants, uh, some ministers uh, to the lodge, uh, but he didn't call any senators. And so they didn't know uh, that the government had been dismissed when they actually agreed to, to pass supply in the Senate at 2.20pm. Um, so Goff is, is a tragic figure and he made a lot of mistakes. But on your point about Malcolm Fraser, look, Mal this, is, this story is about the real Malcolm Fraser. It's not the Malcolm Fraser that I knew um, later in life and had interviewed and talked to uh, who had become a kind of a sort of a progressive uh, figure uh, had changed a lot of his views about policy issues, about the United States alliance, about a whole range of issues. Uh, but Fraser never, ever changed his views about the dismissal. This was a guy who was utterly ruthless. You know, he pushed the political system to the brink. Um, he broke convention after convention. Uh, he relied on a tainted Senate. That is that there have been a number of vacancies in the Senate that were not replaced uh, by Labor senators, but were replaced um, by non-Labor senators. And so he, you know, pushed the system to the brink. And I think he ultimately paid a price for his ruthlessness. Um, you know, John Howard and Andrew Peacock, who were ministers in the Fraser government, told me um, many years ago now that they felt that Fraser was overly cautious and timid uh, as prime minister because he was always aware of the divisions that he had unleashed um, because of, the, of his political violence uh, in 1975. Uh, so... You know, Fraser, this story is about the real Fraser, um, who, who was ruthless and cunning and pushed the system to the brink, but he ultimately paid a price for that. John Kerr was obviously a sad and lonely, tragic figure under siege until the end of his governor generalship and had to live in exile for many years after. He couldn't go anywhere without fear of a hostile demonstration. And, of course, Whitlam was martyred uh, by the dismissal. But, you know, Goff always said he wanted to rem be remembered as an achiever, not as a martyr. He didn't want to be remembered for the dismissal. He wanted to be remembered uh, for his groundbreaking reform. So, in short, Tory, there are no winners, there are no heroes in this crisis. It is just a tragic event uh, for our democracy and our parliamentary system. When you talk about Kerr and the reaction to him afterwards, I want to know, did anyone ever use the headline, Kerr's Karma? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. But, you know, John Kerr, you know, was obsessed by the dismissal. And one of the things uh, Paul and I have been able to do is look at his, at his archival papers held in the National Archives. And these are mountains of documents, you know, handwritten notes, letters to people. He became obsessed about it. Um, and, you know, he did actually dream of having a third phase of his life. You know, he had been the Chief Justice in New South Wales. He'd been a prominent lawyer, barrister. Uh, then he'd been Governor General. And he, and he talked about fresh fields, you know, a third career. Uh, but that was never possible um, because of the public outrage at his actions and the condemnation that he faced by so, from so many Australians. And so he became obsessed about it um, and also became, I think, a tragic figure. You know, people say... Uh, that whenever they met John Kerr in the years after, he would always say to them, do you think I did the right thing? Um, so he is actually a sad a sad figure in, in all of this, but, of course, he brought it upon himself. Okay, let's get to the archives and, of course, the Palace Letters, which is what we're all here for. Paul, when those letters were finally released, obviously after the prolonged battle by various lawyers and Professor Jenny Hocking and others, what's the first thing you were looking for? Well, the first thing we were looking for was what the letters told us about the critical question. 
was the Queen involved? Was the Queen complicit? Was the Queen implicated in the dismissal of the Whitlam government? That was the critical question. And what we found, of course, was we found letters from the palace to the governor general and from the governor general back to the palace confirming that there had been no prior notification by Sir John Kerr to the palace that he intended to dismiss the Whitlam government. Kerr told the palace nothing of his elaborate plans. He didn't tell them he was going to dismiss Whitlam on the 11th of November. He didn't tell them he'd consulted the Chief Justice. He didn't tell them he had advice from the Chief Justice authorising him to do this. He didn't tell them that he would give Whitlam no option of going to the election as Prime Minister. He didn't tell them that he would commission Malcolm Fraser as a caretaker Prime Minister. He didn't tell them that he would take advice from Fraser, dissolve the Parliament and procure an election with Fraser as caretaker Prime Minister. He told the palace absolutely nothing. That was the key finding. Troy, he, Kerr may not have told them, I'm planning all these things, but he, he talked a lot, didn't he? I mean, he was quite a voluble chap. How would you describe the way in which he, would, would you say, bombarded <laughs> Chatteris with, with letters that were tended to be, from my reading, and I in no way have delved into them as much as you guys, but seemed to be sort of sometimes seeking approval, sometimes seeking flattery, sometimes showing off. Uh, there was the classic um, letter where he's really worried about what he's going to wear to his swearing in. <laughs> you know, how would you describe Kerr in those letters? Yeah, look, he was clever, calculating, cunning, um, and he was cultivating the palace to um, the nature of this crisis, uh, he reported his assessments of Gough Whitlam, his assessments of Malcolm Fraser, their options, whether they might prevail or fail. Um, and he was canvassing a range of options, uh, which did include, you know, the possibility of exercising uh, the reserve powers. And so he wanted to sort of condition the palace, I think, quite carefully uh, to a possible intervention at some stage. But See, whenever he raised any of these issues, the palace's response was always very, very clear. I mean, the palace said in response, and this is from the Queen's private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris, he would often reply to Kerr saying that, um, you know, they hoped the crisis would be averted and there'd be no need for an intervention. They made it clear that the Queen was distant from events, uh, had no role to play, sought no role uh, to play in the crisis. And when there was a discussion about the reserve powers, which are, you know, widely understood, they exist, um, they can be used, they have been used before, um, the palace was always expressing caution to him, saying that even, you know, just a week before the dismissal, the palace uh, advised Kerr that they should only be used as a last resort and when there is demonstrably no other course available. Now, that's almost a direct quote from a letter on the 4th of November. So they were hoping that this crisis would be averted and there'd be no need for an intervention. And in fact, a week before the crisis, the palace had actually said, uh, we don't think this crisis has crossed the threshold from the political into the constitutional, therefore requiring an, an, a vice regal intervention. A number of times, the palace also thought that Gough Whitlam would prevail in the crisis. They thought that Malcolm Fraser would have to retreat, would have to back down. So, so there's no sense of a royal green light here or any kind of endorsement. Uh, but Kerr, as you say, Tory, was very, very clever. He was seeking reassurance. He was seeking flattery. The other point I'd make just briefly on this, on this issue, Tory, is that, you know, for the whole period before the crisis, so for more than a year before... Um, John Kerr is writing letters after letter after letter complaining about the Whitlam government. I mean, this is a guy who was in deep frustration with the government before there was even a crisis. So Gough Whitlam thought that Kerr was his man. He was on side. He was a traditional Labor guy. He could always be trusted. But Kerr was complaining about things like the new Australian honours system, uh, the, a new order of precedence. He didn't like some of the public service appointments. He didn't like some of the ministers. He complained about some of the policy decisions. And as you referred to, he even complained about the fact that Gough Whitlam thought he should wear a lounge suit to his swearing in, whereas Kerr wanted to wear an official morning suit, you know, top hat and tails. So this is a guy who was 
two-faced essentially about the palace. He didn't he didn't express any of these concerns uh, to Gough Whitlam directly. He, he in fact expressed them to the palace in letter after letter. And there's a letter that often hasn't got a lot of coverage since they've come out, but we think it's really important. And that is, it's written in January 1975, where Sir Martin Charteris, the Queen's private secretary, advises Kerr to talk frankly and openly with his prime minister, to raise any issues, um, you know, to, to level with him, be understanding, be sympathetic and, and have an open and frank dialogue. Um, they're kind of tutoring Kerr about how to manage this role. But of course, he, he ignores that advice. Paul, I think one of the critical words that gets bandied about here is green light. And obviously, Jenny Hocking thinks there was a green light in what Charteris said. I, by no means, am a constitutional lawyer. <laughs> Just looking at the personality of those two letter writers, it seemed to me that Charteris was quite elegant, sort of dancing around and saying, nope, this is this is how these things work. And while Kerr is bombarding him with all his concerns and um irrelevant details and so on. Charteris is just sort of bouncing it back going, no, mate, that's not our job. That's your job. How would you characterise Charteris and his role in this? Because he's been painted in different lights in various kind of representations, including apparently in The Crown, which I haven't seen yet, but he's painted as quite the bad guy. Well, Charteris is astute. Charteris is a civil servant with a deep understanding of the palace and the confidence of the palace. And Charteris has two principal um, obligations and themes running through his letters to Sir John Kerr. And those two themes are that the Queen has no role to play. The Queen has no constitutional role to play ISIS. And the, queen, and, and the Queen will not be involved in the crisis. And secondly, to the extent that there's any role for the Crown, that will be discharged by the Governor-General. And Charteris stresses that uh, the Palace has confidence in the Governor-General. So that's the essential um, uh, framework there. Um, so it's one of uh, non-interference by the Queen. And we shouldn't be surprised about that. The Queen's been on the throne for 68 years. Uh, she's ha had no record whatsoever um, of interfering in those countries where she's the head of state to liquidate prime ministers she doesn't like. The idea that uh, the Queen wanted to get rid of Gough Whitlam is clearly fantastic. Um, Whitlam had a cordial relationship with the Queen. Whitlam had a cordial relationship with Sir Martin Charteris. There was no sense whatsoever uh, that the Queen wanted to get rid of the Whitlam government and the palace was playing a very careful and straight bat. And as Troy has pointed out, when it comes to uh, the attitude of the palace in terms of the reserve powers, the palace sent a very clear message to Kerr, the main value of the reserve powers is when they're not used. That is, when they're in the back pocket of, of a governor general and he can have a frank talk with the prime minister warning the prime minister so you get a political settlement that's how the reserve powers are normally used that's their classical use and that was the understanding of the reserve powers held by the palace and by charteris and kerr did not take that advice kerr did the opposite kerr staged a dismissal uh, without any prior discussion with Whitlam, without any prior warning, and gave Whitlam no chance to go to the election as Prime Minister. Troy, do you think, um, thinking from the perspective of the public, do people really understand the reserve powers, what they can be used for and their limitation? Because I think most people who have not perhaps waded into the dismissal waters as much as you guys would think, well, you know, constitutional monarchy, uh, the Queen and her representatives are supposed to be impartial uh, and also take the advice of the Prime Minister and they'd probably know that side of it. And therefore, when they hear about the reserve powers, yeah, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. Do you think people understand that? I mean, how, how would you explain that to someone down at the pub who's like, but can the Queen just get rid of the Prime Minister? What? Yeah, look, that's exactly right. I mean, these are um, complex um, and 
powers to understand, they can be a little bit confusing for people because they're not deployed on a regular basis. I mean, some some reserve powers are simply routine, such as the commissioning of a, of a prime minister. Um, and our constitution operates on the basis of a number of conventions. You know, there's no mention of the prime minister in the constitution. There's no mention of the cabinet um, in the constitution. So these are medieval powers that were kept by monarchs um, in the event that there needed to be some kind of intervention to resolve a political impasse or some kind of intervention in what was deemed to be the national interest. Um, and because we have a constitutional monarchy, you know, our head of state is the Queen. Uh, she is obviously based at Buckingham Palace in, in London. Um, but her representative is the Governor General in Australia and the Governor General exercises all of her powers uh, that she has, including just simply commissioning a, commissioning a government, uh, dissolving a, par a parliament for an election. Um, the, these are the things that, um, that are being used on a regular basis, but they're not often referred to as reserve powers. So they can be a little bit confusing and people seem to think that the reserve powers is simply the dismissal power when it is, in fact, one of several reserve powers uh, that can be used. But I think Paul mentioned um, a while ago that, uh, you know, in 1975, this was talked about as one of the options. Uh, some of the newspapers had actually called for the Governor-General to intervene and dismiss uh, the Prime Minister. It was the opposition strategy. There was a Liberal frontbencher, Bob Ellicott. Uh, he's still alive. He'd been a former Solicitor General and he had written a legal opinion that was published on the 16th of October, which was the first day supply was blocked in the Senate. And in that opinion, uh, Bob Ellicott, on behalf of the opposition, called for the Governor-General to dismiss the Prime Minister. So if you were living in 1975, you would have some degree of understanding, I guess, about these issues because they were being ventilated, even though it still came as a surprise and as a shock because it's a rare power. It's therefore a reserve power. It's not used uh, very often. So, look, I mean, I completely understand that these issues are somewhat complex and also the nature of the correspondence. You know, Tori, there's 212 letters uh, that are exchanged between the Palace and uh, Government House in Canberra. Uh, this was an extraordinary amount. Uh, these letters would pile up at Buckingham Palace before Sir Martin Charteris, the Queen's private secretary, could reply on his behalf. We know that previous governors general and future governors general did not write the same type of letters. They didn't write as many letters. Uh, they weren't as open and frank and detailed about uh, political events. And in fact, there's almost no letters of this nature written anymore. In the book, we interviewed Quentin Bryce and Peter Cosgrove, and they had told us that they simply just don't write uh, these letters in their time as governors general. They don't think it's appropriate to be discussing the nature of these issues. So uh, it is a surprise even for today's governors general to realise what was going on just 45 years ago. Well, I think we can all be grateful that John Kerr didn't have email. <laughs> so, Speaking of the governors general since, Paul, after Kerr basically trashed the reputation of the office, has it been a healing time since then? I mean, it's obviously been a quieter time, as Troy points out. I think it has been a healing time. And Sir Zelman Cowan, who became Governor-General after Sir John Kerr, was very committed to what's called the healing process. Now, we've spoken over the years to most of the people who subsequently became Governor-General, and it's very clear that they saw John Kerr and his actions as the anti-model. I don't think there's any question at all that no subsequent governor general would have behaved the way Kerr did. And more recently for this book, um, we interviewed in particular the two most recent governor generals, Quentin Bryce and um, Sir Peter Cosgrove. And they have both made it clear that there's no way they would have done what Kerr did. They believe the appropriate course is for the Governor General to consult frankly and honestly with the Prime Minister. And if there's a requirement for the Prime Minister to, to advise an election in order to solve the deadlock, to tell the Prime Minister that uh, such advice is needed. So we've seen a very significant evolution in the Office of Governor General. And I think this is important. Uh, current Governors-General, more recent Governors-General, 
have not written uh, letters to the palace the way uh, Sir John Kerr did. They haven't felt the need to defer to the palace. Um, they've been much more assertive uh, in terms of standing on uh, the principles of Australian independence as a constitutional monarchy. And what do you think the dismissal overall meant for the ongoing debate about remaining constitutional monarchy versus becoming a republic? Do you think even today it might be switching votes one way or the other? Well, I think what the dismissal indicated was that there are problems within the system. There's no doubt about that. But it also demonstrated that for the system to work, you need wise people in these key positions. You need a wise governor general or you need a wise president. And Sir John Kerr didn't meet that test. The point I make about the reserve powers is that when uh, Paul Keating um, uh, worked on an alternative uh, constitutional arrangement for a republic, and in terms of the arrangement that was put to the people at the 1999 referendum, the office of president had the same reserve powers as is now attached to the office of governor general. Those powers were simply being transferred from the office of governor general to the office of president. And what that indicates, of course, is that you'll need uh, a monarch or a president who's got those powers as a last resort in the case of a government or prime minister who tries to break the law. The other critical point to make here is, as Paul Keating argued in the forward uh, to our book, um, the, the last argument we need to further the Republic is some attack on the Queen and some claim that the Queen was involved in the dismissal in 1975. Now, that's a falsehood to begin with. And for the Republic to actually argue the case for a transition from monarchy to Republic based on a falsehood, that is some sort of claim the Queen was involved, that is a terrible mistake for the Republicans to engage in. But secondly, it's an electoral and pragmatic disaster because to actually start attacking the Queen as the path to the Republic is a complete folly. That will doom the Republic. And we are very critical in the book of the Republic movement at the moment because it's embraced both these views. It's attacked the Queen for her involvement in 1975, an attack which is an historical uh, falsehood. And secondly, it's, if you like, doom the movement because as Keating keeps pointing out, there's no future for the Republic looking back to the past and trying to attack the Queen. The, the Republic has got to be about our future. We've got to come together with a vision about how we see ourselves in the future, not rummage around in the past and create all sorts of myths about what happened in 1975. Troy, do you think the movement is doomed? Look, I think the Republic remains a distant prospect, unfortunately. I mean, I've always been a Republican. You know, Paul, as editor-in-chief of the Australian newspaper, was also a, a prominent Republican and pushing the pushing the case. Uh, there's nothing we would want more um, in terms of our future arrangements than to become a Republic. Uh, but we have to make this debate about the future. Uh, it's got to be about ourselves, our sense of identity, about how we see ourselves um, going forward as an independent sovereign nation in our own region, with our own interests, our own, uh, you know, our own priorities. Um, and we make we make the point in the book that um, you know we think that Noel Pearson, the Indigenous leader, has come across the best sort of formulation uh, for becoming a republic, and that is we must make it a positive assertion of aspects of our history that pick up our Indigenous history, um, our British history, and also the multicultural project uh, that we are still living through at the moment. So it's got to be a positive assertion. It can't be about attacking the Queen. Um, and as Paul Keating and others have said, look, the Queen is respected and admired. Uh, Bob Hawke had that view as well. He thought that we shouldn't become a republic until the end of the Queen's reign um, because Australians like her. They generally think she's done a good job. So they don't want to uh, dispatch her. Uh, they want to keep her on the throne because they, they think she's been a wise and prudent and respected monarch. So the best opportunity to become a republic is going to be about the future, 
um, and after the Queen's reign ends. It can't be about trying to tie her to a, a false representation of what happened in 1975. Indeed. And from all I've heard, the Queen is quite happy for the process to happen, you know, as, as it does. She's not going to hang on sort of tooth and nail to us as a part of the monarchy. Okay. We have got some time now for some letters from some listeners who unfortunately haven't actually heard what we've just said. <laughs> so I'll skip through and find ones that we, we haven't got to. Um, slightly tricky one. Given the parlous state of the government's finances and a hostile Senate denying supply, what might have been the ultimate outcome if Kerr had not dismissed Goff? Well, we think the appropriate outcome, um, given that there'd been no solution after four weeks and the Governor-General felt there had to be um, a solution reached on the 11th or 12th of November, is that it's... It's incredibly simple. Uh, he should have just followed what's expected of a governor general or sovereign and had a talk with the prime minister and indicated to the prime minister that there had to be an election before Christmas and that he wanted the prime minister to provide that advice. That's what should have happened. Um, and now there's one certainty if he'd have said that to the prime minister, um, I think there would not have been a dismissal. I mean, there's no way Whitlam would have just sat pat and been dismissed. Um, he may have advised an election. I think that's the most likely course. He may, he may have taken a radical decision and approached the palace to remove the governor general. That would have been extremely contentious. It would have rebounded very significantly on Whitlam. But the fact of the matter is that that was no excuse for Kerr to engage in large-scale impropriety and not speak frankly to the Prime Minister. Isn't it the case, though, that John Kerr was afraid that that's exactly what, what was going to happen, that Whitlam was going to give him the sack? So John Kerr had convinced himself that Gough Whitlam was prepared to, to move against him and advise the Queen to remove Kerr as Governor-General. Kerr was convinced of that. And that's why Kerr kept his hand secret from the Prime Minister. Now, frankly, we don't know what Whitlam would have done. To have intervened and gone to the Queen to remove the Governor-General, I think, would have been a catastrophic move by Whitlam. The country would have been in uproar. I think that would have rebounded against Whitlam. But the key point here is that that fear that Kerr had was not a sufficient justification for acting in secret against the Prime Minister. That was not a sufficient justification for Kerr not to fulfil the responsibilities of the Governor-General and speak frankly with the Prime Minister. That excuse doesn't hold water. One of the aspects of the crisis, Tory, that's often been forgotten is that Malcolm Fraser actually proposed a compromise. Uh, he did this in early November. He took it to John Kerr. Uh, John Kerr raised it with Gough Whitlam and this was rejected. And the compromise was, was that the opposition would pass the budget, um, they would stop blocking supply, um, in return for Gough Whitlam agreeing to have a general election in May or June 1976. Uh, but Gough Whitlam rejected that. So this is another area where, you know, John Kerr could have, could have tried to persuade Whitlam that this was another workable solution to the crisis. So consider this. Gough Whitlam would have been able to claim a great victory. His budget would have been passed. Uh, Malcolm Fraser would have been forced to back down. Uh, Whitlam would not have been dismissed. He would have had another six or seven months as Prime Minister to try to turn his government's fortunes around. But uh, he rejected that, that compromise offer. And Malcolm Fraser was under pressure from state uh, Liberal premiers um, to put this compromise because they thought he was coming across as being too ruthless um, in his pursuit of, of dismissal and in terms of blocking supply. But that was a, an opportunity gone um, uh, that could have led to a very, very different uh, historical outcome. Troy, how much do you think it's still the case that the, uh, you know, the Senate can effectively hold the government to ransom? I mean, you know, we've had uh, preference whisperers and we've had sort of extraordinary <laughs> cross benches that have obviously uh, done a lot of horse trading in, in terms of what they want. Would you ever be worried again that, about a Senate blocking supply? Look, this is a really interesting uh, point because one of the legacies of 1975 is that this is 
never happened again. Uh, it doesn't mean that it cannot happen again. Um, but when you talk to the Liberal leaders who came out after Malcolm Fraser, this was a strategy that they believe uh, in the main should not be pursued, that it somehow tainted the Fraser government, as I said earlier, made him a little bit cautious. It was a divisive approach and it was completely unnecessary. You know, the Whitlam government was almost always going to lose the next election uh, when it was due because of a whole range of uh, scandals. Um, and it's poor, poor standing in terms of the polls and the perception among the public. So this is a strategy that hasn't been pursued before. I don't think it ever would be, um, but you can never rule it out. I mean, if, if there was an opposition leader that was as equally ruthless as Malcolm Fraser and there was a government uh, in place that had, uh, you know, also been scandal ridden and they thought it should be ejected from office, you just can't rule it out. And one of the interesting things is that none of these things have changed. The only thing that's changed since 1975, essentially, is the appointment um, of senators to casual vacancies. So there was a referendum in 1977, which now insists that they must come from the party uh, that the outgoing senator was from. So, so that's the only thing that's changed. But generally, these conventions, the reserve powers, the capacity to block supply, all of these things remain. But in reality, I think we're unlikely to see it repeated. Paul, is that part of the legacy of the dismissal that now you'll quite often hear the crossbench senators say, oh, look, I'll guarantee supply, but dot, 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 before they begin their, um, you know, trying to leverage the government on something? I think that's right, Tori. I mean, the point to make about the legacy is that the main powers are still in place. The Senate has the power to block supply the Governor General has the reserve powers to dismiss a government. So the powers still exist. But I think the enduring lesson of 1975 for institutions, for personalities, for leaders, for Governor Generals, and for the political system overall is that in any democracy, it's dangerous to push the constitutional system to the limit. There has to be a degree of restraint and discretion within a political system to ensure that it works properly. In a sense, the whole experience of Donald Trump in America in a different way uh, verifies this sort of point. And so responsible leadership in a political system has got to recognise that you've got to ensure that you don't damage the democracy you don't damage the constitution, that you keep the system intact and you keep public confidence and you keep a sense of public trust in the system. Now, I know our politics is um, a pretty rough game, but I do think there's an underlying message which has been taken and has been accepted from 1975. Yeah, I hope so. You do see all those surveys about declining trust in institutions. And another one from our listeners, Troy, I feel like it's a pop quiz now. <laughs> Given Australia's utilitarian approach to constitutional reform, is it not more likely that the House of Windsor will resign as monarchs of the Commonwealth realms in a future post-Elizabethan review of its imperial remnants rather than waiting for each one to take action? Look, I'm not so sure about that. Um, look, constitutional change in Australia is notoriously difficult. Um, just look at the Republic referendum in 1999. Uh, a majority of Australians supported a republic, but of course the tragedy was we couldn't agree on the model. So you actually had Republicans voting uh, for, the, for retaining the monarchy. Um, so constitutional change is extremely difficult in Australia at the moment. And put it this way, um, you know, we now have a majority of MPs in our federal parliament who are Republicans, and it's been that way for some time. And we recently had um, the, one of the most preeminent Republicans in Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister who did nothing about it. Um, so it remains, I think, a distant prospect and an unlikely prospect, uh, certainly as far as the eye can see, into the future. Um, in terms of the, the House of Windsor, look, They've been on the throne for a long time now. Um, they believe in the divine right of kings and queens. So that is the queen believes she is put there by God. Uh, she will not uh, abdicate. Uh, she will see out the rest of her days sitting on the throne. 
and Charles has been waiting as the understudy for a very, very long time. So he's not going to give it up either. Um, and if you watch The Crown, um, you can just see that this is a family that is, uh, is bred and trained for one purpose, and that is uh, maintaining the monarchy and practising that role. So they're not going to give it up uh, any anytime soon. And I, I suspect uh, with a new generation of royals coming through um, that uh, the fascination with the royal family, even the drama, uh, will remain and, uh, and they'll be on the throne and our monarch as well for a long time. Good answer. All right, I think we've just got time for one more that I'll, I'll, I'll take to both of you. Um, we waited quite some time for these letters, of course, because the debate over whether they were, they were private, but now they are part of our history here in Australia and debate will go on about interpretation of the letters. But, Paul, is there anything else we're waiting on? Is there any other document that you'd like to get your hands on? Any other... Is there something else out there that might further um, change our interpretation of our own history? I think it's fair to say that we now know an awful lot. If we look at uh, Sir John Kerr, for example, we've had his memoirs, uh, we've had um, articles he's written, we've had his oral history at the National Library, we've had from the archives hundreds and hundreds of pages of Kerr documents, notes he wrote at the time, notes he wrote afterwards, diaries, journals. And of course, now we've got the 212 Buckingham Palace letters. So the amount of primary source material we have is simply enormous. The reason Troy and I wrote this book was that we knew the Buckingham Palace letters were likely to be the final major instalment of primary source documents, which would enlighten us about the events of 1975. And that's why we wrote this book. Now, there will be more documents coming from time to time, but I think it's fair to say that the broad contours of what happened are now, as far as we're concerned, very firmly established. And we think they're very firmly established in the last two books that we've written. Um, our book titled The Dismissal in 2015 and our 2020 book, uh, The Truth of the Palace Letters. Oh, so there won't be a trilogy. That's a shame. Troy, <laughs> Troy, is there anything else that you would just love to get your hands on? I mean, even in your imagination, is there something that might be out there? Still any great unanswered questions for you? There is. There's one primary source document that we haven't seen yet and we may never see it and that is the queen's diary so we know that the queen every day uh writes uh, handwritten uh, diary entries um and they are deposited into the royal archives and so maybe in 2075 when i am 100 years old uh we might be able to see what she actually wrote um, and I am hoping there will be a, a trilogy. I mean, Paul's already written now four books. Uh, I think he's probably still got one more in him on the dismissal. So we'll keep searching. I mean, this is a this has been like an Indiana Jones enterprise for us, you know, uh, digging deep into the archives, doing the interviews, and trying to find as much information as we can. It's a story that continues to astonish from one generation to the next. So I am I would not be surprised if there are some new material that becomes available in, in future years. So one last point, Tori, is that these are not the only evidence about the dismissal. They're an important primary source, that is, these palace letters. But there are other documents uh, that are also important that we've used in the book and in previous books. There are interviews with people who are involved. There are their memoirs. And so we need to combine all of this together uh, to get a very good handle on what exactly happened and what didn't happen um, to fully understand uh, the dismissal. Well, I very much hope that we get to read Queen Elizabeth's diary as the third installment in your series. Troy Bramston, Paul Kelly, thank you so much for talking to us about the truth of the palace letters. It's out now, all good bookstores. Um, and honestly, it's such a it's such an enthralling read, deep dive into all the details of those letters. So thank you for sharing all of that here at the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tori. Great to talk to you.